Extreme texture in this one, but maybe it's just the stripes, super stripes. Yeah, you're right. Are you a game person? Yes. Yeah. These, these are mine. Really? Um, the first one is, is an Apple II game that I wrote in like the Really? It's running in an emulator on the web. It's on Archive. So that's why I can get the web access. Oh. The other one is one I'm working on currently, which is kind of like a revisitation of it. That's awesome. So these pictures are showing kind of similar rooms in the old and the new. And when did you make the original one? Uh, it was published in 85. And then the company like disappeared. The company like went down very south west. They never got sold. It got traded around on factories because that's what people did. Huh. And then like around 1995, 96, every now and then I'd start getting emails from somebody saying, did you actually make that game? Because I found it and it was mysterious, and I didn't know what to make of it, and I remembered it. Why is it mysterious? It's, it's an abstract game, and there's no, no instructions, especially if you get it like on some random floppy disk <laughs> of arcade games. It's a bit of the, um, what do you call it, the E.T. problem, where it seemed like a terribly designed game, mostly because people playing it didn't have any of the instructions, you know, the original E.T., the Atari yeah, version. I've heard about this, but I know nothing about the game. I just know that they dug it up recently. Yeah. Literally dug it up recently. Because all the ones that were discarded. But yeah, apparently people thought it was like a poorly designed and poorly made, but it's basically like, you know, one of the first adventure games. Oh, okay. You know, it has all the components of what your modern adventure games is. You know, you find a key. It's very bare bones. Wow, that modern version is rather different. What is, how did you, what are you using to make that? Um, it's my own engine. Really? Um, so it's, it's super simple. There's like no shadows or anything. Uh, it's, it's just a straight open GL and C++. Just good old OpenGL. Not a lot of people enjoy that. It takes a special type of person. Well, you know, you to write this in, you know, 65 to assembly code, so... <laughs> so it's a lot better. It's so, a vast improvement. So this picture is actually the floppy disk. It's not one of my floppy disks. It's one I found on a Where's site for a What do you mean? That's all the data on the disk? It's a 140K floppy disk image rendered in Photoshop. And then I used I used this to get some of the original characters out through the alphabet the font. Huh. Because I wanted to use the same font from the original game, like here. And then I brought that into Photoshop and cleaned it up. Wow. So that's all the data on the on the floppy. Right. So that's the code and like you know some of the. The object shapes, so you can kind of make out. How long did this game take you to make? It's, it's a work in progress, and I've been working on it for a little over a year now. Right, right, yeah. That's all? Did you already have a basis for the engine, or did you start the engine from scratch a year ago? Um, right, yeah. Like, my counter engine, that was about six months before that. It was kind of getting yeah. my engine, although it's still lighter, it's a little too mm -hmm. That's impressive. But it's, it's like super minimal engine, you know, it only does, like the physics is only boxes. Right. Um, there's no gravity, no shadows. Mm -hmm. I do like, you know, shading tricks to kind of give it a, some depth. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> That's very appealing. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you play the game? Um, well, when you sit down, there's no controls to start. Oh, is it cheating to ask you how yeah, to play? Absolutely, it's cheating to ask. No, oh, I won't ask. I retract that question. <laughs> Uh, I'm David Van Brink, and I'm working on this game, Metareal. And 
Sorry, I'm terrible. I asked if I played games also, and I actually hadn't been playing games for quite a long time. And just sort of at random, I, I got a copy of Stanley Parable because I heard it was like interesting. Yeah. And I just loved it. It was awesome. Um, and I played another game at 140, which is sort of minimal uh, musical. This place timing game. Culture. Yeah, super super minimal graphics, like these two dimensional solid colors. And it was just And is that what you totally fun. is that what inspired you to start to re reinitiate your development of your and, of and, games? And I think right around the same time I'd gotten like yet another email from someone who discovered like who wrote Metareal or the original army. Really? Because um, you know, every you know once or twice a year or something that's something you know and some things could be short and some things could be longer and I'd be all like, oh that's exciting. Um, so it just kind of and I was getting some free time. So we kind of came together and started to work on this. I don't want to interfere with other people playing your game. <laughs> yeah, you can see I was kind of chuckling a retro a retro look at these things with the screens. How did you I won't ask how you did that, but it's very interesting. It's it's a, basically a shader that emulates character generator hardware. Really? So you know the shader can uh, this part of the shader can only make characters. So what was your experience making uh, character generators? I'm like, um, is that something you were already familiar with? I've done electronics, so I know how to like you know, send out video timing signals and stuff like that. Really? Uh, but I think also I'd, I'd seen recently. Uh, I think I looked at the test mode of Pac-Man and her meme, and I went through like a similar cycle, like showing all the characters you know, A, B, C, D, E, filling the screen. Wow. Kind of reminds me of old Macs, too. They used to do that. You, there was a certain command you could enter in the Apple II, and mm -hmm. the computer would go through a cycle of like all the graphics, oh, okay. a graphics sort of test, I think. Yeah, so it's just kind of of that game. You know, I've always liked abstract things. So I, you know, I know I didn't want to make a game that like had you know, a story or characters or familiar objects. So I think I was just taking that in, like, as far as I could go. But, but you know, still making it understandable. Like, you know, you can tell it's a thing and there's rooms and you go places. Um, and how long did that game t take you to make? About a year. About a year? Yeah, way, way less than games take now. How many levels is it? It's, it's only one big level, and that's true of both of these games. Really? There's only, it's, one, it's an open world. So actually, this is possibly the first, or at least a very early, open world abstract puzzle game. Huh. No, because there's, the, the title of the game is 64 Rooms. Hmm. Uh, and you can move between the rooms up to a point. Yeah. So is there a you open various doors? So is the, are, is that basically a sequel of this game? Not really. There's well, no, I wouldn't say it's a sequel. It's kind of a similar idea. The GUI elements yeah. seem to have seem to be, or UI elements seem to be uh, similar. Where you have yeah, I was, trying, I, was, I was trying to channel you know appropriately. The looks from this game, but as a modern 3D-ish first-person game. Huh. Uh, it can't be a sequel because there's no story. It can't be? I don't know. Oh, I guess sequel usually sequel. implies that there's some... Connective narrative. Thank you. That's interesting. I never would have thought of it that way. Certainly there's a lot of games like Pac-Man. Does Pac-Man have a narrative? Right. Is, is Ms. Pac-Man a sequel? Uh-huh. Good point. I don't know, but it's... It's probably a similar relationship. So, you were telling me, what? Uh, how did you program this game? Uh, that was all straight 6502 assembly language. And so, what is that like to someone who has no idea what assembly language is like to program in? Um, it's a lot of three-letter codes that do a very small amount of work, like LDA 23 to load the value 23 into a certain register. Um, 
So to get a pixel to show up on the screen, if you were at a certain value into a certain memory location. So that would be very difficult. How would you keep track of all of the things you were doing? You probably wouldn't be able to do that inside the programming environment. So would you keep a, would you like know separately what you were creating? Do you know what I mean? No, like, really, it's the same as programming now. There's, it's just no different. Huh. Um, you know, we, we have higher level languages now, but it's just, it's all the same. Really? It just still, it's a programmer today still has to keep track of the same things that may or may not be in the code. So what are you thinking about for your next game, or are you planning that far in the head, uh, or if you, this is if your... If I could imagine the end of this game, I might think about a future game. Really? So no, 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 uh, no intent beyond the end of this. And what have you done in the interim of the first game and the second game? I uh, just worked for boring non-game software companies. Just being a real software engineer. Yeah. Most recently I worked at Skype. Really? Uh, doing like, you know, server, web server, <laughs> API stuff. The opposite of this kind of fun stuff. Do any of the skills carry over? Not really. No. I mean, it's, it's all engineering. It's all software. So do you consider yourself an artist? I mean, do you look at your... Are secretly, you, sure. Yeah, secretly, yeah. Hmm. Well, this, this show is put on by the VGA Art Gallery, so... They clearly acknowledge easy. you as being an artist. Yeah, oh, I see what you mean. That is an open question. So what would you say your philosophy is toward game design? What is the your approach? Um, uh, in my case for this, be as self-indulgent as I want, because it's, it's all mine. I, I don't expect to make money from it, so I, well, I'm free from all constraints, uh, except finishing it before I run out of money or die. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you don't spoon feed the player any information like each step in the game is learning the game yes that's um, a similar thing you might find in like portal and so oh, it, portal portal's a beautiful game yeah um, yeah portals uh, the few games i've played that's one of them that's super compelling and actually someone wrote to me in about 2010 um, he wrote a blog entry saying, I don't know if anybody else remembers this game called on. Uh, in effect, he wrote, it was the portrait precursor, but in primitive pixels. Really? So, I was, at, at that point, I hadn't heard of Portal. I was it 2010? must have been later. I don't know when Portal came out. Um, but anyway, so he, he, wrote, he wrote this blog entry after Portal had come out. I don't know what that was. Huh. But, and at that point, I hadn't played it yet, so I, you know, kind of had it on my list of things I wanted to check out. Right. Have you played Portal 2? Uh, yes. I actually enjoyed that more than Portal 1 because it was um, technically easier but, but more humorous in the story. Yeah. Yeah, I think they had really matured into what the game, how it would be approached, mm -hmm. in the, and then they really could have time to kind of flesh it out and make it into a more full game. Oh, it was just great fun. I mean, they were both just great fun. Do you read any science fiction? or? Tons. I love science fiction. Really? What, what are some of your favorite science fiction novels? Uh, Rudy Rucker, Greg Egan. Do you know either of them? Rudy Rucker, and who's yeah. the other one? Uh, Greg Egan. Greg Egan? No. I was reading Harlan Ellison. Before I came here, mm -hmm. a boy and his dog, and um, usually I read um, Larry Niven and that kind of thing. Oh, I've read all of Larry Niven, Moon Space Stories, and uh, his last few books I was less excited about. But his early, you know, kind of 70s, 60s, 80s. Do you feel like there's a connection between... That's a leading question, I'm sorry. Do you feel like there's a connection between the science fiction um, sort of culture in the 60s and 70s and the modern gaming culture? Ooh. Well, there's, there's a lot of science fiction games. Uh, I think puzzle games in particular, there's a very similar mindset of, of um, doing science to try to figure out the world. Hmm. Like, you know, in Portal, you have to be a scientist to kind of start understanding how everything works. That's a good point. Um, You're kind of a science... I, I try to do that here as well. Like, as you say, you start with nothing, and all you can do is like push buttons and try to figure out what's the cause and effects. And over the course of the game, the cause and effects will be more and more remote. Um, you know, at first it's like, oh, okay, push a button and you can see what happens. And then, you know, the second button is to press, something happens that you can't immediately see. So those, those connections will become increasingly abstract over the course of the game. <laughs>
which is why you wouldn't let me play the second level without playing the first level, because I would be lost. Huh. Well, that was actually compassionate of you. Yeah, although I just raised some questions like, you know, to get the game good, it has to be play-tested, like each of the levels you want to do play-test and kind of right. see if someone's able to understand what's going on. But it also, you know, only makes sense from the beginning. So I'm not quite sure how to go about that. Like have, have some sheet notes to jump into the middle or something. Huh. I'm try to split the difference. Well, it was really good talking to you. Well, thanks. Very similar to what I was doing. Yeah, except, uh, it kind much of looks more like it. Interactive and so if you randomize all the oh, parameters, man. so so the trick to get the, the weird color, the weird colors is to put um, the brightness through something nonlinear. So I have RGB going through like several sine waves of different sizes. Because if it's linear, then you either get like all white or all black with like yeah. it pins. It pins to primary okay. colors. Yeah. But if it's not linear, then, then it starts finding these like. So, so do you do that in the shader? It's all in the shader. Uh, so it's in the Yes. Yeah, the vertex shader is just like mapping some plots. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's. So in some of the parameters, one of the parameters is how much of the previous frame to leave, which corresponds. Um, okay, let me back up a moment. Have you ever taken a video camera and pointed at the TV screen? Mm -hmm. yeah. You get like a Hall of Mirrors effect. Now, if you do this on an old TV screen, one that's like a phosphor TV screen, old TVs have a row of buttons, uh, knobs at the bottom, like brightness and contrast, and you can crank those up. So you crank up the color and brightness and contrast, and then, you know, put your camera on a good tripod, so you can just turn it a little bit, and you can just sort of really complicated, like, spiral patterns. So that's what I'm doing here. <laughs> so one of the parameters is the opacity of the new frame, and that kind of corresponds to the phosphor, um, the, the, the luminous decay, I don't know, I guess phosphor decay, like how long the image persists. And um, by turning that up, you get a slight more stability because it doesn't flicker quite as much. So like if I turn, turn the phosphor all the way down, so there's no persistence, then it's like more sparkly, like much less stable, and more flickery. And if you turn up the phosphor, it kind of smooths it out a little, goes slower. And if we add more blur to it, and it gets really slow, and you get to start getting these pictures that almost, almost freeze. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I showed that to you. So. <laughs> the shader test, I think? It's, it's simulating shader. video feedback with shaders. Ah. And um, it's also set up so if you have like a USB Nintendo controller, okay. so I would use this as an installation piece with, with controllers. Yeah, you get some really good results here. I've seen someone do something similar with this, but I think it fed back into some sort of uh, synthesizer, so it was making yeah, like, weird aspects. Oh, right. Video synthesizers? Yeah. Like but I mean, like, for uh, like audio, audio stuff, too. Oh, cool. Yeah, it would be good to have some It was similar, not the same. It. And then, you know, I just played with it a lot to yeah, find yeah. parameter ranges that were mostly interesting. Because there's a, a huge amount of the parameter space is just like gray, yeah. all gray. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's stable too, it has these stable configurations. Sometimes it takes a while to set up. You want to drive around? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs>